I have been informed by Barbara that those who fill out a card, everyone who filled out a card will receive a book by somebody at the end of the service. Um, and so if you would like a copy of the book, Surprised by the Lord's Prayer, it will be available in the foyer afterwards if you sign one of the cards. And there may be some mercy and grace. If you fail to sign one of the cards, you may be even able to fill a card out and get a book anyway. But one per family, please. One per family. Uh, started something Friday night that we are doing a theme song for this series on the Lord's Prayer. And it may not be familiar to some of you. And, and we're just going to sing it a cappella. It's called uh, um, Just For Today. So we will sing it through twice. If you will join me, I will do my best. But join me as we sing this chorus that I believe will prepare us for the message. Father God, just for today, help me walk your narrow way. Help me stand when I might fall. Give me your strength to heed your call. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. Father God, just for today, help me walk your narrow way. Help me stand when I might fall. Give me your strength to heed your call. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words Bring honor to your name. The message today has been building from what I presented Friday night and what I presented during Sabbath school. And a number of you weren't able to be there. I learned something, as I said in Sabbath school time, from my seminary professor, that he would do a recap with each new, uh, each new lesson, each new class of the previous class. I learned more from him and I retain more from him than anybody. So for those who were here, you're going to hear some recap that can maybe send home what we talked about. And for those who weren't here, you're going to have a brief recap. And if you want to see the, it was all recorded, you can find it on the website so that you can catch up. Um, we first on Friday night talked about the fact and we admitted that there is a struggle that people have with prayer for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of my f favorite books on prayer is by Philip Yancey. And in that book, on page 15, he says this, that as he was writing his book, the publisher conducted a, on the website a poll, and of the 678 respondents, only 23 felt satisfied with the time they were spending in prayer. That is 3%. Now, that's not a good, strong survey because it was just people responding. It may not be completely accurate, but my experience as a pastor is that people do struggle with maintaining prayer. We talked about the fact that prayer should not just be a prayer time when we pray at certain times, but it really needs to be a life of prayer. When I started out in ministry, when there were seminars on prayer or the books that I read on prayer, they usually focused on one of two things. The correct way to pray, you need to kneel. Um, actually, in the Bible, there's kneeling and standing both. S S Solomon tried to do it both ways. He knelt with his face down and his hands up when he, when he uh, dedicated the temple with a prayer. 
The other thing was proper preparation, making sure you have it, enough faith so that God would answer. And I don't know about you, but I've talked to many people who wondered why their faith wasn't strong enough to get the answer they wanted. Or it might be preparation for prayer to make sure that your sins are out of your life. Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to wait till all the sins out of my life before I pray, um, there's not much chance I'm going to pray. Not in this lifetime. So focusing on proper preparation, proper words, proper addressing, proper correct ways didn't really help people a whole lot with improving their prayer life. In fact, if you think about it, there's nothing in the Bible that says you have to fold your hands and close your eyes. If that helps you, fine. Jesus lifted up his face to heaven when he prayed in John 17. But Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer. Because he recognized there are different types of prayer that people fall into very readily. The first one is repetitive prayers. And as you look at Matthew 6, verses 7 to 9, before Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, he said, when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. And some people say, well, if he knows what we need before we ask, why do we need to ask? Because he needs to know how genuine you are about what you're asking. But I want you to notice, he says, don't heap up empty phrases or repetitive phrases. And some may say, well, that's not really a modern issue, is it? And as we talked about on Friday night, think about your prayers. How many times do you say things the same way over and over again? Lord, bless this day. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, please help me today. You know what I mean? Let's be real. So we struggle with repetitive prayers. There are self-centered prayers. Ask, ask, ask. Make request upon request. I want you to picture, think about a family member, a close family member. Brother, sister, child, whatever. They don't live with you, okay? Some relative doesn't live with you. There's a knock on the door. You open the door and they say, Hi, you know what? I'm kind of strapped for cash. Could you please give me $100 because I've got a bill I've got to pay? Thank you, bye. A week later, they knock on the door. Two children next to them. Hi, I'm stuck. Something came up. I need someone to watch my kids. Can you watch my kids for me? Thank you. Bye. Two weeks later, um, I'm going for a job interview, and I I need a new suit. Could you help me get a new suit so I can get a new job? Two weeks later, they knock on the door, and you don't answer. You get my point? There are thoughtless prayers, but we just pray and say what we say because we're praying. Let me give you a brief example, and please don't misunderstand the example I'm going to give. Most of us, most of the time, will say grace or our prayers before we eat pretty much the same way every time, right? A common phrase we pray is, and bless the hands that prepared it. You probably should have prayed that before they prepared the food. (laughs) And why not bless my wife who prepared the food for me instead of just her hands? (laughs) And if I'm preparing the food, you better pray before I prepare it, okay? (laughs) As then there are pretentious prayers. We think about the the publican and the Pharisee, where the, the Pharisee says, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like the Gentile or like, the, like a woman. I wasn't made a woman. Thank you. And the publican beat his breast and said, Lord, be graceful, great, merciful to me, a sinner. But there's another kind of pretentious prayers that I have heard. And Louis Giglio was very honest in his book, in his DVD about how great is our God. He talked about his early experience with prayer, and he said, most of my praying had been made up of advising God, correcting God, suggesting things to God, drawing diagrams for God, 
reviewing things with God and counseling God. Have you heard those kind of prayers before? I've been guilty of saying them myself. We have a checklist, a to-do list for God that we want to bring to him and, and we want him to answer it in the way we think he should. I wrote the following phrase because I think it is true after studying the Lord's Prayer. We have failed to understand the primary purpose of prayer. And in so doing, we have lessened its spiritual impact on us and lessened our impact on others for the kingdom of God. We are going to talk today about the primary purpose of prayer. When I was preparing and studying for the Lord's Prayer when writing my book, I decided I was going to look up the words of each phrase in the Lord's Prayer and see what Jesus, only Jesus, what Jesus said about each phrase each one of those concepts. So I looked up what he, everything in the Gospels that Jesus said about the Father. I looked up everything in the Gospels that he said about the kingdom. I looked up everything in the Gospels he said about God's will. I looked up everything he said in the Bible about bread, etc., etc. And I was totally surprised by what I learned about the depth of Jesus' prayer. Hence the title, Surprised by the Lord's Prayer. Last, uh, the Friday night, we looked at the first surprise, and that's that Jesus modeled each phrase in the Lord's Prayer in his life and ministry. He didn't just pray the prayer, he lived it. And if you think about it, he talked often about his Father in heaven. If you think about it, he proclaimed the kingdom of God, right? If you think about it, he said, I am the bread of life, and he fed the multitude. If you think about it, he gave forgiveness to those who needed forgiveness. And he experienced temptation and God delivering him from temptation. Every phrase in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus lived out in his life and in his ministry. And he gives us that same prayer because he wants you and me to know that we can live out that prayer too in our lives and in our ministry. But we can't do it if we merely recite the Lord's Prayer now and then. This morning we talked about surprise number two. God is the focus of the Lord's Prayer. Now some commentators, most commentators say that, wait a minute, uh, the first phrase, the second phrase, and the last phrase are about God. The ones about Bread and forgiveness and temptation, those are about us. Well, there, there's some truth in that. But ultimately, it's really a focus on God because the sentence is an understood sentence for the subject. You, God, give us this day our daily bread. You forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You lead us not in temptation. It's really focused on God. But we tend to make the focus on us. Let's be genuine about it. We looked at Matthew 6, 9, the first phrase in the Lord's Prayer. This then is how you should pray. And I don't have time to talk about that right now. But if you want to learn about the meaning of Father and Our and what the name means, in that first phrase, you can watch the video later. But we had a time of prayer afterwards, and this number of you afterwards came to me and said, it changed how I view prayer, just with that one phrase. Now, we're going to look at what I call the heart of prayer. The third surprise is that the sequence matters. The pattern in the Lord's Prayer matters. It is important. I talked earlier the, about the fact that there is a, an acronym that people have used to help people in their prayer life. It's called ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. Some of you may have heard of that. However, that acronym leaves out a very important part that the, whole, that the Lord's Prayer includes. And so we're going to look at the next phrase, the second phrase in the Lord's Prayer. It is the heart of the prayer. It is the heart of what should be the heart of our prayers. 
In Matthew 6.10, in the, today's English version, it says, May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I'm going to show you a list of aspects or characteristics of God's kingdom. You don't need your phones. We'll put it on the website. If anybody can't go on the website, I'll be happy to print it out for you. I don't want you focusing on the screen and taking pictures. I want you to hear what's there, okay? Is that fair enough? So... There are 12 aspects or characters. When I studied the kingdom of heaven and what Jesus said about the kingdom of heaven, it's interesting, I found 12 characteristics. Now, most Bible students recognize the number 12 in the Bible is a symbol of what? Kingdom. The number 12 is a symbol of the kingdom. How interesting that there's 12 aspects or characteristics of the kingdom that Jesus talked about. When you pray, your kingdom come, what do you usually think about? If I may be so bold as to suggest, I think most of us think about Jesus coming in the clouds. And there is that aspect to it. And we'll talk about that. But I want you to notice, let's look at the first aspect. The kingdom of heaven is future. The scripture's clear on that. You can look up Matthew 16, 27 later, but he said, you will see the Son of, God, of Man coming in his kingdom, returning to earth. Certainly the kingdom of heaven is future. But another aspect is the kingdom of heaven is present. Remember what Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Is that future or is that present? It's present. I want you to notice that uh, he goes on and talks about in verses 19 to 20 of that chapter about how the kingdom is to be present. And so the kingdom of heaven is both future, but it is present. And I believe when Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, he was primarily referring to the fact that he wants his kingdom, the characteristics of his kingdom, to be present in our lives so that we can be present in the future kingdom when he does come. Do, do you see that? Third characteristic. The kingdom of heaven is the reign and rule of God. Jesus said that he was Lord of the kingdom, the Lord, in Matthew seven twenty one. It almost seems just obvious that if God is the God of the universe, if he's king of the universe, then he is the one who reigns over the kingdom. And so it's his rule and his reign, and we belong, if we belong to his kingdom, we come under his rule, and we come under his reign. And he's the one that sets the standards, not you and I. The fourth aspect of the kingdom the kingdom of heaven is a place of righteousness. The very well-known passage, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's a kingdom of righteousness, of doing right. And you and I can't perform that righteousness on our own. We need to be empowered by the Spirit. The next aspect... The kingdom of heaven is made available through the gospel of grace. In Matthew 19 through Matthew 20, Jesus told the parable of the, of the, uh, of the workers in the vineyard. You remember that parable? Some came and worked all day. Some came and worked four hours, some six, some just one. They all got the same wage. And at the end of that parable, he says, it's up to me to give as I promised. All receive the same reward because I am a God of grace. And so the kingdom of heaven is made available through grace. The sixth aspect of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is available to all. It's available to all. And we look at the parable of the wedding banquet. He ends up saying, go out into the highways and byways and invite the lame, the maimed, invite, invite everyone to come in because I want everyone to share in the blessings of my kingdom. The seventh aspect is the kingdom of heaven is entered through faith. There's a whole chapter in Matthew 13 about the kingdom of heaven and people trusting in God to make them part of that kingdom. 
What's interesting is we get kind of con confused a bit when we talk about, wait a minute, is the kingdom available through grace or is it because of my faith? When I was writing my book, this thought came to me. The kingdom of God is available because of God's grace. But when I trust in him, I believe that I can enter into the gates. Now, I didn't say it the way it's written in the book. It's written in the book better. But the kingdom of God is available because of grace. I enter the gates when I trust in him that he has provided it for me. The next aspect of the kingdom is the kingdom of heaven is motivated by love. That is almost too easily said. How we interact with others, how we live out the life in the kingdom of God will be motivated by love for others and not just love for self. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus gave the great commandment. The great commandment consists of loving God and loving others as you would love yourself. The kingdom of heaven also involves sacrifice. Remember the time when Jesus confronted the rich young ruler and said, rich young rulers, what must I do to enter into eternal life? That's the kingdom, right? Jesus said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And he went away sorrowful because he couldn't do that. And then Peter, in his impetuousness, says, Jesus, I sacrificed. I left family. I left friends. left my boat. left my business. How do I stand? And Jesus said, those who get the reward from this earth will get the reward on this earth. And those who give up everything will receive great reward kingdom of heaven will require sacrifice. It will require sacrifice of our time. It will require sacrifice of our talents. It will require sacrifice of even some good things in our lives that we rely on too much that we must give up. The kingdom of God involves, the kingdom of heaven includes God's power over evil. When Jesus began his ministry, what did he do? He healed the sick. He cast out demons. All these are the results of sin and of the devil's work. He made the, the, the deaf to hear and the, the, those who couldn't speak, speak. But more importantly, he freed people who were bound in sin. And so the kingdom of heaven is, includes God's power over evil. The kingdom of heaven expects growth, Matthew 13. It expects Two kinds of growth. It expects us to grow in our spiritual walk with God, in our relationship with God. It also expects that we will be those who help sow the seed of the gospel and reap the, the harvest when it comes. And finally, the kingdom of heaven is Jesus himself. In Luke chapter 1, verse 31, the angel told Mary that Jesus would be one to sit on David's throne you may ask, Pastor Gary, you rushed through that. What, what's that all about? At the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, he teaches us to focus on God, to spend time thinking about the characteristics of God and how God is related to us and what God has done for us and what he offers us. But then he says, before we make any request, he says, pray that your kingdom will come into our lives. You see, the purpose of prayer is that we will be transformed to become more like Jesus. That's the number one purpose of prayer. The number one purpose of prayer is not necessarily, and please don't misunderstand this, it's not just getting answers to my material needs, my emotional needs, my physical needs. The primary purpose of prayer is that we connect with God that we find out what he wants from us, not what we want from him. Because if we change it and make it the other way, we're going to tell him what we want first, we may ask amiss and often do. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us that we put the aspects or characteristics of his kingdom and we talk with God about that before we talk to God about anything else. Because when we do, it changes what we ask for. 
I can testify to that. It has changed what I asked for. How do we do that? I think there's two questions you can ask God as you think about his kingdom and the characteristics of his kingdom. I personally keep that list of his characteristics on my desktop of my computer. And before I pray, I look at those characteristics again. And I think as we look at those characteristics, you can ask God, which aspect of your kingdom do you want to increase in my life today? God, do I need more faith today? God, is there something in my life I need to be more right with you? I need your righteousness more. God, do I need to experience your grace? Do I need to express your grace more today? What aspect of, of, your, of your kingdom do I need to experience and express more than I have been lately? You'd be surprised at the thoughts and feelings that will come into your mind. The second thing you can do is you can say, God, reveal to me those aspects of your kingdom that I can praise you for implanting in my life. It doesn't all have to be negative. And that can be awkward at times. God, pat me on the back. That's not what it's about. It's about being honest, saying, God, how do you really see me? Am I someone who expresses grace or do I express judgment? God, if, if I'm one who expresses grace, thank you. Thank you. You may say, but if I do that every time, won't I get repetitious? I think, the, I think the opposite is totally true. You won't be using cliches anymore. Yes, now and then. We all revert back. I've done that. But you'll be praying about things you never would have thought about praying of before you started. It will change how you pray, and it will make time with God more meaningful. Time with God more meaningful. The second part of that phrase is, Thy will be done. Jesus summarized God's will as desiring all to believe in Jesus and be saved. If you think about it, He created us for fellowship with Him and He wants us to be with Him. That everything else comes under that umbrella of God's will. We think of God's will as God, should I take this job or that job? God, should I buy this house or that? God, should. And you can pray about those things, it's appropriate. But if you haven't prayed about God's will for you to be saved and for others to be saved, if you haven't prayed about God's will for how to relate to him, and you immediately launch into a laundry list of what you want from him, you've got it in the wrong order. Last night, two or three people questioned, well, what about God's will? We pray for God's will and then he doesn't answer. We believe it. What about that? Or what if we pray and ask for God's will and, and nothing happens at all. I think the answer is in this phrase. You see, we have it reversed most of the time. I've done it. You've done it. God, bless my family. Or God, heal my, my, my father. Or God, give me a new job if it's your will. We make our request, and then we say, this is what I want, but only if it's your will. It's almost like a tag on. Jesus taught us to pray and ask God for his will to be done in our lives before we make any request at all. What does that do? My personal experience is, things I thought I was going to pray for got changed in the middle of my prayer because I was praying, Lord, I want your will to be done in my life. Does that make sense at all? Let me use a rather homey illustration. When my kids were teenagers, they never asked me if they could stay out till 1 o'clock. Why? They knew it wasn't my will. They knew me well enough to know that that wouldn't fit into my will for them because it wasn't best for them. When it comes to answers for prayer, years ago I was, even before I was a pastor, I was working as a summer youth pastor. And I was teaching some, kids, some teenagers. 
And we were talking about answers to prayer, and I said, well, God always answers prayer, the typical thing. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says maybe, or later, and sometimes he says no. And a girl raised her hand and said, I, I don't believe that. And I said, really? And she said, yes, I, I believe God says yes, sometimes he says wait a while, or sometimes he says wait a while, and sometimes he says I've got something better in mind. I've never forgotten that. When we pray and follow the pattern of the Lord's Prayer by first focusing on God, by then reflecting on and meditating on and asking God to reveal to us those characteristics of his kingdom that he wants implanted in us, and asking for his will to be done in our lives, then when we start making requests, we are open to different requests and God answering in different ways than when we merely say, God, this is what I want you to do if it's your will. It makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. The sequence or pattern for prayer is crucial. Some may say to me, Pastor Gary, if I'm following the, the pattern of Jesus' prayer, do I have to follow it all the time? Of course not. But certainly we need to follow it more often than we do. We did a little experiment, as I said before, at the end of Sabbath school, where people just focused in prayer on the first phrase. And it made a big difference and took them away from the cliches if what I saw and what I heard was true. There is so much more, so many more surprises that I discovered in the Lord's Prayer. My suggestion is not that we use the Lord's Prayer merely to recite the words of Jesus, but we look deeply into the Lord's Prayer and discover that if we follow the pattern on a regular basis, and sometimes, there are so many times I never get past thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I have spent so many long minutes and hours even on that phrase alone. And sometimes you may be talking about, Lord, give me the daily bread. I need food on the table for my family. And that is absolutely perfectly fine. But only as we align ourselves in recognizing that God wants to transform us so that we belong to his kingdom in ways that people will recognize and that we are living to do his will in ways that we never thought possible. I'm going to end this with a communal prayer. After I read the quote, I almost forgot. <laughs> and this is a quote that, that I, something I wrote. We need to take this phrase in the Lord's Prayer far more seriously than we have in the past. I am convinced that this phrase is the hardest one to say while being honest with ourselves and with God. Only when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, are we prepared to apply the rest of the Lord's Prayer when we pray. Some may be concerned that applying the pattern of the Lord's Prayer to our personal prayers may become repetitious. Ironically, when we use the Lord's Prayer as an outline or a model on a regular basis, our prayers will be less repetitious and more meaningful. I believe that with all my heart. I'm going to ask you to stand. Ask everybody to move across the aisles, move across the aisles, and before COVID I would say hold hands, but if you're not comfortable holding hands, grab an elbow. No one should be standing by themselves, absolutely no one. And I'm going to ask you to sing the Lord's Prayer with me as our benediction. I will try to pitch it as best I can. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.